Hello ladies and gentlemen, Teo here, back with more Ever-17. We just, uh, I believe woke up from a really depressing dream, where like everything went black and then we died. So that was uplifting. What an awful way to start the day. I pulled out my PDA to check the time. We'd read 3.18am, good god. But all the drowsiness had left me. Uh-oh. Attempting sleep again would have been a waste of time, and I thought I'd only have another nightmare, if you can get to sleep at all. Nearby I could hear soft breathing. Coco and Peepee were nestled together comfortably, asleep. Trying not to wake them, I opened the conference room door and sneaked out. Outside, the hallway seemed endless. For a moment, I had the illusion it went on forever. Stop being stupid. Without hesitation, I stepped into the cold water filling the hallway. I realized how oddly accustomed I'd grown to this spectacle, this strange sensate er, this strange situation, this daily routine. Being continually enclosed by walls. Walls that, in a matter of time, were doomed to come crashing down. Where will I be when it happens? I decided not to think too deeply about it. I already decided not to think about things like that. Climbing the emergency stairway, I headed towards the white stock. Reaching the infirmary, I pushed the button to open the door. She's not here. The bed was empty. The spilled nuts were gone. I wondered if Tsugumi had cleaned them up, or was it someone else? In the meantime, no one was in the room. Reaching out to the lemma terminal, I touched the screen. No reaction. The monitor lights were out. I walked toward the security office. I thought that maybe the terminal there would be online. Opening the door, I hesitated at the smell. As always, the room smelled like smoke. I tried the terminal. The screen read, Periodic maintenance in progress. The message continued. Lemma, full system periodic maintenance program in operation. Until completion, portions of lemma functions are inaccessible. Estimated completion time, 6 a.m. While under maintenance, automatic control systems throughout the compound will be partially offline. However, facilities and attractions will operate normally. Note, since all sensors and recording systems operations will be checked during maintenance, function may be erratic. Therefore, it will not be possible to access data through the terminals. Warning, this maintenance program should not be aborted except in cases of emergency. If aborted, there is a danger of making the Lemma system unstable. Therefore, please refrain from accessing Lemma until after the maintenance completion. Thank you for your cooperation. Additional note, until the maintenance completes, I will be unavailable. Everybody should be asleep at this time anyway, right? I informed everyone about this operation at dinner time, but in case any of you forgot what I said, I'm leaving this message. That is all. Good night, Sora. Well, how about that? Gee, Sora, I guess you forgot to tell me about this. Was he not at dinner? Well, then again, maybe I just wasn't listening. God damn it, Takeshi. See, this is why nobody likes you. I was probably busy eyeing that extra piece of sausage in the refrigerator. Trying not to be seen by the others as I hid the sausage. And later cooked it up. I'd been gloating over it until being caught, and then... Certainly not expecting to be throwing it up only a half an hour later. Was I stupid or what? I was lucky it wasn't worse. Oddly enough, I hadn't felt hungry since. Anyway, having no particular place to go, I found myself in front of an elevator. Uh, obviously we push the button. Like, what kind of question is that? Like, given the option between push the button and don't push the button, what self-respecting, uh, irresponsible adolescent male wouldn't push the button? Like, a real talk? With no clear reason in mind, I pushed the elevator call button. Click, click. All it did was make a noise. The elevator showed no signs of budging. But of course. All the elevators in this section of the compound had been shut down. Hi! Hearing a voice from behind me, I turned my head. And there was Tsugumi standing quietly. Hey, what were you up to? There's no point waiting around. This elevator's not coming. I didn't have an answer to give. Takeshi, what's the matter? Uh, are you deaf? <laughs> I couldn't help but laugh. Come on, what's going on? <laughs> what's so funny? Tsugumi seemed slightly disturbed. I think we all are. It's... Nothing. No special reason. It's just that, well, I thought your question was pointless. Wow. Cold. And also really funny. At first, Tsugumi started to frown. But then she laughed back at me. You started to catch on, haven't you? I suppose. I was just out for a little walk. What have you been doing? Ah, oh, that's okay. You don't have to answer. In that case, don't ask. Turning her eyes away, Tsugumi frowned slightly. Looking at the floor, she seemed lost in thought. After a moment, she lifted her eyes and spoke. 
say Takeshi, you know what Koala is? Koala? That's right, Koala. Uh... No? Is it like a kind of egg? I don't know. Actually, I think I knew, but then I forgot. Right. Okay, I'll tell you. Koala is the jellyfish gondola ride. Oh. Is it? And it's located just behind this elevator room. Oh, is that so? Then we both fell silent. It was kind of a non sequitur. Not, not sure what to make of that. Tsugumi started to giggle and gave me a hard look. We both knew what we were going to do next. With Tsugumi in the lead, we headed for the Koala ex entrance. It's like, how do you make this thing work? Go figure. Go figure? Come on, tell me. It's already turned on, dummy. Just get in and it'll go. That's it? Look, I tried it out already, so I'm pretty sure. Eh, well, if you say so. Wait a second, you've already tried it? Well, yeah, I tested it. Tsugumi's face looked troubled as if she'd been caught at something. You're saying you wrote it alone? Well, not exactly alone. So, who was with you? Uh, the hamster. It's not who I was with. You see, well, I was with Chami. Oh, called it. You mean your hamster. Well, yeah. In other words, one adult and one critter. Yeah. You rode Koala with Chami? Yes. Don't make me repeat myself. Well, how was it? Fun? Chami fell asleep. I guess he was bored. But as for me, who cares? It's a meaningless question. Tsugumi hadn't said much, which was a lot more than usual. Hmm. In other words, you were lonely, huh? If I was there, I could have cheered you up. What do you mean, cheer me up? Well, you know, you've been through a lot. And I thought maybe the two of us together would... Yeah, right. But then suddenly, Tsugumi's expression lost its tension. <laughs> <laughs> All of a sudden, she let out a laugh. Hey, what's going on with you? Did I say something stupid? Probably. Like, I wasn't even paying attention, but the answer to that question, just like, in general, is yes. Nah, not really. It's nothing important. It's just that I needed to laugh. And then suddenly, her expression hardened again. But then again, I thought, but a slight smile still remained on her face. Let's go. Okay, you say so. Together we got inside the ride. Immediately after the hatch closed, the gondola began to move forward smoothly. It was just as Tsugumi had said. The jellyfish-shaped gondola picked up speed and headed toward the outskirts of the white stock. The corrugated tube carrying the gondola wrapped its way along the perimeter of the floor. Floating comfortably inside the tube, the gondola skirted its way along. There's something I've been meaning to ask you. What is it? Well, something I wanted to ask. Something I wanted to confirm. It was strange that Tsugumi would have something she wanted to say just to me. Her, behav her behavior seemed extremely odd. It's strange, but... It's strange, but it seems that... Like I'm beginning to lose it. Like I'm going crazy. Oh? Huh? So tell me, where are you? Out of nowhere, she asked me again. What do you mean, where? Uh, right here. Yeah, but where is here? You know, here is here, right? I beat the palm of my hand against my chest. Have you ever cut your fingernails? What's up with you all of a sudden? Tsugumi leaned over urgently, right in front of my face. In her eyes I could see something, like a distant light. I could just glimpse the tip of her tongue, wet and smooth. That's an odd thing to focus on. Just answer, okay? Have you ever cut your fingernails? I would certainly hope so. He's what, like late teens? Good god. The prospect of having, like, not cut his fingernails ever in his life is horrible horrifying to think about. Speaking of which, I should probably cut my fingernails. I should, like, write a memo to do that after, uh, after I'm done with the Let's Play. Nah, whatever, I'll remember. Of course I have. Well then, is the nail that's been cut away still you? What do you mean? Oh, this is, like, the, the thing with the, the, like, the classic joke about the axe, right? There's a, there's a woodcutter, and he's like, yeah, this is my favorite axe. I've, uh, replaced the handle six times in the, the Blade 3, or something to that effect, right? And the, the, the philosophical question is it like, is it still the same axe? What do you mean? I mean, are you there in the nail? No, I guess once it's gone from my body, it's not me anymore. How about hair? Same goes for hair. In that case, this hair here is you, right? But if I pull it out... 
Ow! I reflectively put my hand on my head. Tsugumi had yanked out a couple strands. This isn't you? Tsugumi held the hair up, waving it around. Hmm, that's tough. It isn't me, but... I guess you could call it X-me? Okay then, what if I rip your arm off? You gotta be kidding! Tsugumi grabbed my arm. And before I could react, I was drawn into her body. Although she wasn't abnormally strong, I found it impossible to resist her. It was a natural, flowing movement. Inside the white gondola, Tsugumi's body covered mine. Now, now, kids. Keep it PG-13. I could feel her, feel her breath. I could feel her pulse. I could feel the warmth of her body. And then she ripped my arm off. I could smell her scent. The smell of musk. It made me slightly dizzy. God. What am I reading? Well, if I ripped your arm off? Gazing intently at me, Tsugumi continued shooting me questions. Would you be there, in the arm? No, I suppose I wouldn't be there. Okay, and what if I took off your leg? Or if I cut your torso away? Or even if I took out your brain? Still gazing at me, she moved her hands and put them on my neck. It felt like I was being hunted. The illusion was intense. She looked straight at me. And this, kids, is why you don't get in the gondola with crazy. I couldn't shake myself away from her gaze. I peered deeply into her eyes. I felt like I was being sucked inside her. Those eyes, full of that distant light. I wonder where the light originated from. Tell me, Takeshi, where are you? I'm... Where am I? Me, Takeshi Kuranari. Since the moment I was born, I had existed as one person. One continuous, linear, cohesive individual. There was no doubt about that fact. The me as a baby in the photo album, the me running around in elementary school, and finally the me sitting there. They were all the same organism called, uh, Takeshi Kuranari. Come on, be, con be consistent here. Like, you... I, I don't even care if you use Japanese ordering or English or ordering, but that's just sloppy. So where exactly did the entity called me exist? In the past, people thought the soul existed in a person's heart. Descartes believed that the soul inhabited the pineal gland in the brain. The brain. I wondered briefly if I existed only in my memories. But if that were the truth, then if I lost my memory like the kid, wouldn't that mean I was no longer Kuranadi Takeshi? Thoughts, senses, emotions, sensations, character, values. All these things were nothing but functions of the organ called the brain. For one thing, the me that ran around in elementary school was composed of different molecules than the me there. From purely a material point of view, my younger me was entirely different than my older me. Cells die and are replaced daily. Every cell that replaced that is replaced will also die. They say that cells in the entire human body are completely replaced every three to five years. By comparison, a rock would be composed of the exact same molecules five years before, or five years hence. But a human body was different. The cells of me five years ago were not the same as the cells of me then. Even so, the me of five years before and the me then were definitely the same. Then, just what was it that defined me? Where did that me exist? All this time, Tsugumi continued to hold my neck with her hands. Little by little, she began to apply more pressure. And then we died. After a time, it became difficult it became difficult to breathe. My mind began to fog over. I was slowly drif drifting toward chaos. You, s you see? Your existence has no substance. All you are is a concept. You're just a packet of information. Software. The information written on a CD has no physical body, right? The CD itself is just plastic, a hard mass of polycarbonate. That mass has nothing to do with the information it holds. Information can't have a physical body, that's impossible. Information doesn't have shape or substance. The embodiment of information only takes place through its application. However, the embodied information itself has no actual body. The essence of information is the information itself. Takeshi, it's the same for you. There's no physical substance to the essence of Takeshi. Instead, the human called Takeshi Kuranari is no more than a concept, information, software. And that essence is realized only through your body, the hardware. That's it. Your body's just the hardware. It's just a device in which the entity of you is embodied. Why do you... <coughs> I spit out the words with difficulty. How come you are... Was I making any sense to her? I couldn't tell. The weight of Tsugumi's whole body was on my neck. I can't... I can't... I just can't. For an instant, her grip loosened slightly. 
I can never escape. I'm bound eternally to this horrid body. My soul is forever in chains. Sugumi became teary-eyed. So that was the light deep in rise. Tears. Hey, Takeshi? Would you kill me? Half laying on her side, she grabbed my wrists. She tried to force my hands to her own neck. Please? Well, you asked so nicely, I don't see how we can refuse. Kill me? W what are you talking about? I broke away from her grasp. Why are you talking like this? Yeah, I get it. Tsugumi muttered, her voice shaking, and her gaze drifted off. You're just a coward. Just a gutless man. In fact, you're not even a man. It's got nothing to do with this. Come on, please. Kill me. Can't you do it? Are you crazy? There's no way I could do such a thing. Why not? Why can't you? Of course I can't. I... I don't need a reason. I don't want to. Why do you want to die so badly anyway? Why do you need someone to kill you? Please, it's because... Forget it. Are you really so unwilling? You're damn right I'm unwilling. Well, in that case... In that case, I know. I'll kill you instead. With all her strength, Tsugumi slammed me to the floor and started choking me. Ah. I'll give you the gift of death, and then I'll... Ah. With all her strength, she slammed me down. Slammed me down. And slammed me down. Again and again. Stop it! I would die if she kept it up. No, I was dying. If she doesn't stop, I'm a goner. Attempting to force her off, I scratched her. Something red started to drip from her lips. It was blood. She's bleeding. Blood mixed with tears. Suddenly, her shadow loomed over me. I couldn't see a thing. And then her mouth closed on mine. Our lips pressed hard together. I'm so confused. It's like the weirdest foreplay ever. My mouth was filled with the taste of her blood and tears. I'll kill you. I will. I'll kill you. Oh. Oh. No. Don't leave me alone. No, please don't leave me alone. Please, Takeshi. Please. Darkness surrounded me. Or maybe it wasn't there at all. A darkness without awareness. I heard only the slight rustling of clothing and Tsugumi's sigh. Hearing that sound, I felt a craziness swell up inside me. Two shadows overlapped to become one. And I plunged into the chaos farther and farther and became one. Well, that was exciting. Afterward, I went straight back to the conference room. Both my mind and body were exhausted. Even though little remained of the night, I slept soundly. When I awoke, I felt refreshed and fully recharged. Wait, we're just gonna kinda gloss over that? He's like, alright, well, that's the thing that happened. And now we're done. Apparently, no one had noticed my disappearance during the night. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning, Sora. Morning. Yeah, hi there, Sora. A little later than usual, Sora presented herself in the conference room. So how about it, Sora? How'd the maintenance go? Well, yes. The system is in sound condition, although there would be no way to repair any mechanical damage if it were to occur. The scheduled maintenance program checked out. I can assure you that the entire compound is functioning normally. Well, it's good to hear. After carefully assessing the situation, I found a slight noise in my thought processor. Normal functions won't be compromised, so no modifications are necessary. Hey, Sora, what does that mean? Well, Coco, it means that... You see, sometimes certain customers want to play pranks on me. They tell lies or try to confuse me. And because of that, my memories or programmed responses get a little out of alignment. It tends to cause issues in my thought processing. Sometimes older data gets mixed with newer information, making it difficult to determine which is correct. When this problem becomes severe, it's necessary to fiddle with the system and overwrite the problematic data. However, at this time, nothing too drastic has occurred, so please don't worry. Okay. Other than that, I have yet to complete a full check of the sensor data which was recorded throughout the compound while you were all sleeping. I doubt any new leakage has occurred, but I'll report back to you once I've checked the sensor data. Thanks, Sora. We're counting on you. Yes, leave it to me. By the way, thanks to the maintenance program, the Lemma terminal response has greatly improved. There was a slight problem concerning Lemma traffic, but it's been resolved. Terminal communication functions were optimized to adjust to Lemma's current status. Hmm. Hey, Sora, what do you mean by traffic? I'd like to know more about what exactly is was tweaked in the terminals. Alright everyone, why don't we go to breakfast? What? Is it just me or did you just totally ignore my question? 
Oh well. Perhaps you just couldn't hear me. Everybody lo relocated to the chicken sandwich shop. And as always, I cooked up breakfast for everyone. Looking at their faces as they ate, I suddenly felt relieved. The faces of you, Coco, and the kids seemed so happy. Sora just stood, stood by quietly watching them enjoy the meal. However, Tsugumi was nowhere to be seen. After breakfast, we still we each had plenty of free time. I'm still deeply confused about what's going on with Tsugumi. Like, I assume she's not just losing it. Like, I assume there's something more going on there. But I'm still, like, completely in the dark as to what it is. Like... There's something very wrong with her. Like, that much is clear. But the specifics are eluding me, and it's kind of upsetting, actually. But there was nothing in particular to do. Nothing that just had to be done. So without any reason, we all just ended up gathering in the rest area. As always, the vases were filled with blossoming flowers. Marguet... Mar... Marguerites? Marguerites? Flowers, marigolds, and roses. Apparently, the flowers were watered periodically by mist from the sprinkler system, helping them maintain their freshness. I didn't see Sora anywhere, but then again, she did say she hadn't finished checking the sensor data. She probably had gone down to the control room. It seemed she could concentrate on performing operations better there. You, who had been talking with Sora earlier, was strolling alone around the top of the circular stage in the middle of the room. The kid, Coco, and Peepee were chasing each other playfully through the water. I had a feeling I had seen this all before. After having a good stretch, I watched Coco and the others play. The three of them, two kids and an animal, circling the stone statue. They were playing a game of chase, not really caring who was it. Without seeming to get bored, they kept running around and around. I seemed to be making more effort than they were, just watching them. Phew, what a sight. It looked like fun, but I quickly gave up any idea of joining in. And at any rate, Tsugumi had yet to make an appearance this morning. Just in case, I left a sandwich for her at the kiosk. I don't know if she'll actually eat it or not. What would I say to her if I met her? So talking to her again would be awkward. She had told me while we were on the jellyfish gondola. Kill me. I couldn't. There was no possible way I could do such a thing. But still. Why did I feel like I had messed up somehow? Something had come over me. There was nothing I could do. I glanced up and noticed Coco and the others had stopped playing. Oh, what's she doing? With a worried look on his face, the kid was watching Coco intently. Peewee, too, had his eyes on her. In the middle of the rest area stood four stone statues. Coco was deliberately attempting to scale one of the pedestals. Here I go! With a heave, she began to climb up the side. Uh. It was an odd sight. I ran to the kid as he st stood frozen watching her. Okay. Stumbling as she mounted the pedestal, Coco ended up embracing the statue. Coco, what the heck are you doing? The kid asked her curtly. Yahoo! Wow, all I did was stand a little higher and everything looks all different. Let's see, to be exact, 27 inches higher, don't you think? Perched on top of the pedestal, Coco said this triumphantly, smiling. Huh? Hey, Coco, is that why you climbed up there? What? Well, mm, well, actually, no. Coco answered with her head cocked. This area right here looks like it's missing something. Missing something? Which area? The statue's back. Is she gonna carve in it? Because that would be, like, deeply confusing. I kinda thought his back looked lonely. Coco stroked the statue's back sympathetically with her tiny hand. And well, abracadabra, screwdriver at ya! Uttering a stream of nonsense, Coco suddenly produced a flathead screwdriver in her right hand. Okay. Interesting. Because this is, like... Because the kid... Okay, new, new theory. The, the two sets of roots aren't disjointed temporally. They're disjointed, like... They're, like, two strands of space-time or something? But they're happening in parallel. So... That explains why earlier in the, inf in the infirmary, originally in the kid's route, the kid went into the secret room beneath the infirmary and saw Coco, but Takeshi couldn't see her, right? And then in Takeshi's route, Coco is the only one there. Which means that either the kid or Coco has the ability to, like, cross between the timelines? Because the same thing's about to happen here, right? Where she's carving in the back of the statue, and... 
only the kid could see her in the kid's route. And here, she's just doing her thing. So that either means that the kid has the ability, or the, the kid in the timelines where the kid is the protagonist, has the ability to see into the timeline where Takeshi is the protagonist, and the two t timelines are different. Or Coco has the ability to somehow cross between the timelines, but the first explanation sounds more plausible than the second one because it was consistently only the kid who was able to see her, right? Like, if it was an ability inherent to Coco, then presumably people other than the kid would have been able to see her. But because... the kid's the only one that can see her, it makes more sense for the ability to be the kid's. So we get pretty much hard confirmation of this if the scene in the whale room happens again, or the, the door in Heimel happens again at the end of this route. Because those were both pretty much on the, the last day, right, when the kid finds Coco in the whale room, overlapping with Sarah. And when the kid watches Coco disappear into Heimel. So if Coco does either or both of those things, here, then that is pretty strong evidence to support some interpretation of my current theory. And this theory, I feel like, has, enough, has like, legs. I, I, I feel like I'm closer to the actual truth of the situation than I was at any point in the past. I think this is, like, the closest I've been to a theory that actually makes sense. Uttering a stream of nonsense, Coco suddenly produced a flathead screwdriver in her right hand. Times two! And then, another one appeared in her left hand. Hey, where did she get those? Before I could ask her anything, Coco was gripping two screwdrivers. And then, into the back of the statue, she began to carve the stone using the tip of the screwdriver. Here we go! Cut, 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 carve, carve. And within moments, the back of the statue was covered with gashes. Although setting aside all the, like, timeline hopping and conspiracy theories, like, what the hell is she doing? But that, that's vandalism, young lady, and vandalism is a crime. It was incomprehensible. I just couldn't understand it. First she says the back looks lonely, and then she starts gouging it. For a while, the kid and I just gazed at her with our jaws dropped. Hey, hey, what are you doing? The kid yelled as he came back to his senses. I'm carving. Can't you see? I'm carving. I'm etching some marks into the stone. Oh, really? Etching some marks. I could tell that by watching you, Coco. It's not what I mean. What for? The kid beat me to the question. Well, it's because, uh... I was feeling lonesome. And anyways, I was... Feeling sad. I was feeling sad. She muttered in a tiny voice. She worked with great dexterity, using a screwdriver in each hand. So, forgive me for being slow, but I don't see the relationship between these two things at all. Like, I understand feeling like lonely and sad, and uh, there are certain worlds in which I can understand vandalizing the statue with a pair of screwdrivers, but I don't see how the two things are related at all. The tips of the drivers dug into the stone, screeching and forming new grooves. Sad. Well, nobody's coming to rescue us, right? We've been abandoned. So what harm is there in wrecking the place a little? The kid and I looked at each other. Coco looked back at her handiwork. The gashes had begun to take on a shape. It was a human form, like a stick person. Its tip formed a round head. Who's that? It's me, Coco. And look, this is Pee Pee and Chami. Looking more carefully, I could see two unusual animal figures beside the human form. Oh, that's what it was! I remember, originally, when I was doing the kids' route, being very confused about why there were two animals, and we finally found out why! Wow, this is very exciting. This is a red-letter day. Okay, and then, one of the shapes had a particularly large head. It was only half-finished. This is Sora. Sora's pretty, which makes her hard to draw. Tra-la-la, tra-la-la-la-la. Singing a cute little song, Coco continued to carve. She seemed entirely absorbed by what she was doing. Somehow, I could relate to her desire to throw herself into something. That's destroying private property. It's vandalism. 
Hey, relax, kid. Now's not the time to be so uptight. Coco's into her work. You can't blame her. Um, right. Here we go. Next. Uh-oh. Because of her unsteady position on the pedestal, Coco suddenly lost her balance. Hey, be careful. Without hesitating, the kid jumped forward, steadying her body. He grabbed her by the hips to prevent her from slipping down and carefully lowered her to sit on the pedestal. Oops, thank you. Watch your step, okay? Okay. Ah, I know. Why don't you join me, kiddo? You mean... Come on, please. Let's both try it. You can carve a picture of yourself and knock you here. And then I was thinking of carving Takepion over here. Okay, he's one of my screwdrivers. Well, okay. Thanks. Energized by Coco's enthusiasm, the kid took the screwdriver and mounted the pedestal to join her. Be careful not to fire yourself, kid. I'll be alright. Don't slip, Coco. Why don't you let me hold you up? Oh, well, I wonder if that's the... She'll be alright. I was about to stretch my hands towards her, but the kid stopped me. Don't worry, I got her. The kid took hold of Coco's empty hand. While embracing the statue in a hug, Coco and the kid steadied each other. And using their free hands, they both began carving shapes. The statue didn't say a word, only stood silently, pointing at the ceiling. I mean, I would certainly hope the statue doesn't say a word. A while later... What was, left in this, what was left in stone was the carved images of six people and two animals. It was evidence of our existence here. That afternoon, after a light lunch, I looked around but couldn't find you anywhere. Looking for you? She ate lunch and then went to the security office in white stock. Okay. Hmm, interesting. Because even if the kid... If I remember correctly, and I'm not a hun I'm not even like 80% sure that I'm remembering this correctly, like 60 or 70%. But the kid saw the carving, right? Yeah, he would have had to, otherwise I wouldn't have remembered that it had multiple animals on it. So the kid saw the carving in his story arc, which is weird. Like if he can see Coco, that's one thing. But it, being able to see like physical distortions on objects that she'd left doesn't make as much sense unless we posit that the carving was there beforehand. Which makes me think that maybe the kid's route isn't like 15 years after Takeshi's route, but it's like immediately afterwards. Like it's like seven days with a uh, Takeshi as the protagonist, and then something happens, and then seven days with the, the kid as the protagonist. Possibly, like, back-to-back. -back. And I don't have great evidence to support this. Certainly not as good as the uh, Coco is, or, like, the kid can see the Coco between timelines. But my sort of my evidence for this is that I don't think Coco makes it out, right? Because if the kid did in fact, if the kid is in fact seeing Coco's actions and like what happens to her in this timeline, Coco doesn't make it out of the facility. In fact, like the first, the first time he interacts with her under the infirmary, she's like, like, I want to get out. And the kid's like, don't worry, I'll get you out. And she's like, no, it's too late. Which makes me think that she like already didn't escape, but I guess that doesn't make sense because Man, I'm confused now. But in any case, like, the last time in the kid's uh, roots that Coco appears, she disappears into Heimel, right? So if that's what's going to happen to her at the end of this route, then it stands to reason that she doesn't escape. Which makes me think that maybe nobody escapes. Maybe they all have to go into Heimel together because nobody comes and saves them. An interesting point here to note, then, is we don't know whether or not Coco has uh, precognizance or not. And it could go, that one could go either way. Like, it's pretty evident that the kid has it to some degree in the kid's route. Pretty evident that Tsugumi has it to some degree in the kid's route. But it's possible that Coco has it here, because, like... If we scroll all the way back up, do, 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 do. where was it? 
some marks, feeling sad. Nobody's coming to rescue us, right? We've been abandoned. Like, she's saying that with more conviction than I would expect, given their current lack of information, right? So that sort of implies to me that she knows that nobody's coming. And the only way she could know that is if she has, you know, some sort of precognizance. So it's entirely possible that Coco has outside information, like information outside of the uh, natural about uh, their fate or whatever. Which becomes even more plausible when you consider the, like, the meta fact that, that Coco's route is the final route, right? So clearly it's the most important, and it's the one with all the answers. Which means that, like, Coco, there must be more to Coco than meets the eye. And that would also um, explain why in the infirmary, Coco was like, you're lying, we're not going to get out. We're, we can't escape, right? Because if she has precognizance, then obviously that's something that she can know. Interesting. All right, we, lear we learned a couple things there. She said something about doing some research. Research? I wonder what that could be. She didn't say exactly. If you really want to know, why don't you go ask her yourself? Yeah, I guess you're right. What about Sora? Where'd she go? She's still in the control room. I spoke to her through the terminal intercom, but she seemed really busy. As usual, Tsugumi was nowhere to be seen. But the sandwich I left at the kiosk was gone. Come to think of it, neither you, Sora, nor Tsugumi had said a word to me all morning. Something's up, I can tell. At any rate, I figured I would go search for them. But I still didn't know where I should- but I didn't know where I should go. Uh, where am I supposed to go? Do -do 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 -do. Going to the control room. I tried the control room. I pushed the button to open the door and it slid open. Sora, are you in here? I called out her name but got no response. The console was silent. That's strange. I wonder if this means she finished checking the sensor data. But if that was the case, I thought she would report back to us. Sora, where are you? Hey, Sora! I expected to find her hiding in the corner somewhere. I called out for her again, but still got no response. Next, I touched the terminal. Although I didn't know how to operate it, it seemed to be responding. A map of Limu data suddenly appeared on the lemon monitor, but it didn't tell me anything. And there was still no sign of Sora. I decided to check somewhere else. I headed for the second floor. Uh, we're going to the infirmary? Infirmary. Turning down a corridor after climbing the emergency stairs, I came out in front of the infirmary. Huh? The door abruptly opened in my face, and a person came flying out. And then dodged right past me. In a flash, the figure was gone, without even seeming to notice me. Who was that? I whipped around qu quickly, trying to see who the person was. It was Tsugumi. Hey. I started to call out, but hesitated. The events from the night before popped back into my mind. I could stop her, but what then? In the meantime, all I could see was Tsugumi's back fading farther away. Hey, wait up! Where are you going? Barely getting the words out, I dashed after her. I ran up a corridor and hurriedly climbed the stairs. But the sound of her feet faded down the end of the emergency corridor. Her figure had already rounded the corner out of sight. Tsugumi! I was out of breath. I'd run about 30 yards, but... Damn it, Tsugumi, you sure are fast. I grumbled after her, although she was now well out of earshot. I didn't feel like I could catch up with her at all. Her speed was unnatural. She was supposed to still be recuperating. Yeah, I'm still confused about that, too. Like, my theory about uh, alternate timelines and the kid being able to see Coco and Coco having precognition and whatnot is, like, all well and good, but it doesn't explain how Tsugumi is, like, up and about after sustaining an injury that was supposed to keep her bedridden for months. Like, that that one I got nothing on. Hey, Tsukumi! I called her name without much hope, but there was no answer. In the end, it seemed Tsukumi hadn't noticed. It hadn't seemed that she was trying to avoid me, but maybe I was better off this way. I mean, she was trying to avoid you to some extent, right? Otherwise, she would have said something as she, like, walked past you from the infirmary. Giving up, I went back down the stairs and returned to the corridor. 
I decided to stop by the nearby security office. As usual, the room felt smaintly. The room smelled faintly of smoke. Oh, my there, Takeshi. Noticing me enter, you turned toward me from the console. Say, you, you haven't been smoking, have you? I only said it in jest, but you looked slightly offended. No way! How could you ask? You know the rules. No smoking until you're legal. You can joke if you want, but I can't believe you'd say that. I mean, just look at my fresh, silky skin. This is the soft skin of a lady. This is the kind of beauty that's impossible for a smoker like you. Ha! <laughs> you spoke smugly, mocking me. Hey, I don't smoke. Oh, really? Hmm. Anyway, let's stop all this stupid talk about smoking. I mean, you started it. I just wanted to ask you something. The kid said you were doing some research. Huh? The kid said that? You gave me a slightly surprised look. So tell me, Takeshi, what exactly did the kid say? I don't remember exactly, but... He just mentioned you were researching something, so I thought I'd ask you myself. Well, in that case, I guess I'll let you in on it. Turning back to the console, you began to type. You may not remember this, Takeshi, but... I've been researching stuff about Lima for quite a while now. She spoke with her eyes glued to the monitor. And then there's the thing about my father. Huh. Or have I told you about him yet? It must have been the first day I came to this place. When you started startled me by suddenly starting up the dolphin carousel. I heard about him then. So, have you found something? Not yet. You shook her head slowly. I can't remember if that's actually like a thing that happened. Like, it sounds plausible. But... It would be super funny if I'm like... If that's actually something that happened to the kid and I'm just misremembering it, or, like, not remembering that that was how it went down, and it's supposed to be, like, this big hint, and I'm just totally missing it because I just assume that that's a thing that happened, because I don't, I don't remember, like, the early parts of the route well enough. But I'm pretty sure that, 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 that that's actually how it went down. Like, Takeshi went to the carousel, Yu was like, her dur, my dad went missing, her dur. Like, that sounds plausible. That sounds like a thing that probably happened. So, I'm gonna avoid reading too far into it, because otherwise... I start going down really interesting roads that are probably not going to lead me anywhere. You shook her head slowly. Eyeing the monitor, she had some more keys and entered a code. I could only find the password. Password? If I just had the password, I could access all the data inside Lemme. Normally, all the data concerning Lemme's system is security protection. And of course, the personnel data, or the personal data of the development staff as well. So I'm hunting for the key to unlock that protection. An emergency override. Oh, so that's what you've been up to. Yep. But I have to give up. You stop typing. Er, but I give up. But not, I have to give up. Taking her eyes off the console, she looked at me. Hey, by the way, if you disconnect Lemma's security protection, what'll happen to Sora? Sora? Well, since Sora's an AI program inside the Lemma system, won't she be affected? Hmm, yes. Naturally, if the protection's removed, Sora would be totally exposed. Naked. Naked. I'm um, Takeshi. Did you just think of something kinky? Me? When I say naked, I don't mean Sora's image will be nude. I I wasn't I wasn't thinking that at all. Yeah, sure. You seem pretty suspect to me. I, I mean I don't really care, but Sora won't become Sora won't become nude, but all her thoughts, memories, and various data will be accessible. That's an invasion of privacy. Well, not exactly, really. Come on, wait a minute. Okay, so if you find that password, will that mean you can save Sora? Save her? I mean, you could copy all her source data to a high-capacity hard drive or something, and then take the data out of here by hand, right? Well, yeah, it could be done. Except that won't be necessary. You spoke coldly. Huh? We don't need to save Sora. She's saved already. How's that? The fact is, Sora doesn't actually reside in Limu. More precisely, the brains of Sora reside in a supercomputer on Insul Null. Are you following me? Meaning that even if Lemu sinks, floods, or explodes, Sora won't be damaged at all. Be because she's not even here. She really lives above the ocean. So from our point of view, just like her name in Japanese, Sora is in the sky. With that, you point her finger toward the ceiling. Blurred by her pointing finger, I looked up. She's not... she's just pointing at the sky, dude. As if I expected to find Sora there. Naturally, she was nowhere to be seen. Pretty sure Takeshi is like a few cards short of a deck. 
Hey, 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 hold on a second. How could that be? All data communication lines within Solnol have been cut. They're useless. Sora herself said that. It doesn't make sense. If, as you say, Sora exists above us, then how could she appear before us here? That's what I mean. Suddenly, Yu's voice level dropped. So, what? Come on, Takeshi. You think it's strange too, right? Sora said that thanks to the maintenance program, communication functions were optimized. In order to perform per periodic maintenance, the master supercomputer on Insul Null has to be linked with Lemma here. And she, since she said the maintenance checked out fine, that means there must be a, there might be a data communication link up and running somewhere. What? Why would Sora keep this from us? What I'm going to say is only speculation, but you furrowed her brows together. I think it's possible that someone is intentionally hiding the facts from us. You're saying that Sora could be lying to us? No, it doesn't necessarily mean that. I mean, but she very well might be, right? Because we established in Useroot that under her original settings, Sora places a higher priority on the corporate secrets of Limu than on the survival of the rest of the cast, right? So it is entirely within our frame of information to believe that Sora is not actively working towards getting them out of Limu. If getting them out of Limu meant compromising uh Limu Corpse. I don't know, trade secrets or something. Right. Like keeping them alive is lower on a priority list. You shook her head as she spoke. On one hand, someone might have created a program to orchestrate the whole thing including keeping Sora silent. Or it could be that Sora might not be involved. Maybe she doesn't know anything or just hasn't noticed. But for now, I don't know if it's true or not. Whether my suspicions are correct, or all just a big misunderstanding. Anyway, I can worry about that after I've cracked the protection. For now, I'm just trying to access the supercomputer on Intel Null from this console. I don't know whether I can even gain access, but I'm pretty sure that's where the data is. Yep, at least I know where the data is. Well, at least it's a start. You suddenly became more upbeat. Cracking the security protection is going to be a real pain. Stubborn code. So what exactly awaits hidden inside? It's a little too soon to go up there. Until I can get inside, it's the same as not knowing a thing. You said this and then gave a big shrug. Yeah. But I still think it's loads better than knowing nothing at all. Well, maybe you're right. You gave me a smile. She then popped her neck and rotated her stiff shoulders. Now then, back to work. All right, you, good luck. Still time. Okay. Turning her back to me, you began to peck at the keyboard. But still, you know, without stopping your hands, she muttered quietly. My mother used to tell me all about my father's habits, so I know there are clues to be found. Decoding something as inorganic as a computer program is possible because even programmers have habits. For a long time, you stared at the monitor. She didn't look my way so I couldn't read her expression anymore. But I could tell by her shaky voice. She was probably crying. Without saying a word, I slipped out of the security office. Is Sora really an insult null? If so, no matter whether Lem is crushed or not, she'd still be okay. Tell me, Takeshi. After you escape from here safely, what's the first thing you want to do? Were her words just a flimsy attempt at compassion? I feel like I've gained a new perspective on human life. Come on, everyone. Believe in tomorrow so you can live today. Were those words just robotic programmed phrases? Simple utterances encoded to pacify and comfort humans? Suddenly, I felt a distance between Sora's existence and my own. It was time for dinner. Wow. Mood whiplash. I made enough sandwiches for everyone and passed them out. Everyone moved with them to the rest area. We gathered on the circular stage in the center of the room and began eating. At a wave of Sora's hand, a gentle rain started pouring from the ceiling sprinklers onto the flower beds. There was even a small rainbow. Smiling, Sora stared at the fl fresh flowers and the sparkling rainbow. Her smile was so carefree. I didn't want to think it wasn't real. I didn't want to think she was just pretending for our benefit. But was she really smiling because she wanted to, or was she just trying to cheer us up? We don't need to try to help Sora, she'll save herself. This thought wouldn't leave my mind. Then again, there were others here too. 
One of them opening her mouth so wide didn't seem it would open anymore. Now, she looked right happy. Takeshi! And it flipped off the wrapping paper. I want another sandwich! Please! Would you be so kind as to make another one and bring it here, pretty please? She called out to me in a voice that seemed just a little too sweet. It seemed to me that she had been crying earlier, but it must have been my imagination. All right, all right. She's such a slave driver. <laughs> what was that? Did you say something? Nothing at all, my lady. Just as long as you realize who's in charge. Oh, ho, 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 ho. Reluctantly, I trudged back into the kitchen. I can't believe that girl. It wasn't like they were hard to make. We had plenty of provisions. Still, I was irritated somehow as I waited for the cold oil to heat up again. I anxiously fidgeted as I waited. The wire basket struck the frying pan with a clang. I'll just get this done as soon as I can. Hey, a customer had shown up without warning. I'd like to ask for another one if that's okay. Jeez. W what, Takeshi? Did I catch you at a bad time? Tsugumi looked annoyed. Eh, Tsugumi? Um, you don't want to make one? Huh, no, no, it's just... D don't worry about it. It's okay? All right, settle down. I'd allow myself to get worked up. Trying to shake off my frustration, I replied. You just want one? Yeah, thanks. Oh, yeah, one more thing. Tsugumi said this as she turned around. What about you, Coco? Hmm, I'm not sure. Coco peeked out from behind Tsugumi. What do you want? Maybe I'll eat just a little something. Well, how about some bread? Okay, sounds good. Takepion, I'd like some bread, please. What is going on? Like, Tsugumi is being way more demure than, like, her character up until now would indicate. Like, I'm still not on... I'm still not really on board split personality disorder, but it feels like something of that... Ilk. Okay, okay, gotcha. Thanks! <laughs> By the way, Takeshi, were you upset a little bit earlier? Are you feeling okay, or is it... Nah, it's not like that. It just takes a little while for the oil to get warmed up, so I was irritated is all. Oh, was that it? She flashed me a smile. Okay, don't worry, just take your time. Who are you and what have you done with Tsugumi? I'll be waiting. Tsukumi grabbed onto Koko's hand and started walking slowly away. She was smiling so gently. It didn't seem like she cared about my troubles. Every time we met, I never knew how to react, and it bothered me some. Had she totally forgotten about the events of the other night? I had to wonder. Well, if she doesn't care, then I suppose that's best. Tsukumi before me then seemed like she would never talk about dying, even by accident. I decided to believe that her smile was real. And guess what? You wanna know what? I had a dream last night. Tsugumi was listening to Koko intently. What kind of dream? I was riding a whale. Interesting. Koko seemed to be truly enjoying herself. And Kiddo was riding on it with me. And the whale was like totally bouncing all over the place. I just kept hopping and jumping. And we were in outer space going to this place called Planet Squid and we're flying all around. And then guess what? I met someone from Planet Kwee Kwee. Hmm, oh really? So you met some, someone from Planet Kwee Kwee, eh? Yep, yep. Kato and me, we both met him. Is that so? That's great, Coco. Tsugumi listened to Coco's nonsense with a smile on her face. I watched their interaction quietly, tried to sense what they were feeling, and... Takeshi, what's taking you so long? I went into the rest area and Yu was lounging about lazily. What the hell are you all worked up about? I'm not worked up about anything. It's just you're so slow that I was wondering what's taking Takeshi so long is all. And so, how'd it turn out, Chef? You really don't know when to shut up, do you? Look, it's right here, so stop worrying. When I showed you the package, she shrugged. Tsugumi and Koko had already finished theirs, and were following behind me. I headed over to the circle in the center of the room. Here, it's a Tanaka special. Take it. I got up on the round dais and threw the package directly at you. What are you doing? Splat. The package flew over Yu's knees and landed softly in the center of the stage. Hey, come on, wake up, will you? I pretended to show surprise. 
Be careful, those are some gour gourmet goods, you know? Well, you're the one who threw it all of a sudden. <laughs> Yu's cheeks puffed up. She picked up the package and dusted it off. Sorry, I was just joking. I lifted both hands in mock apology. I was worried it would fall into the water there for a second. Oh, stop it. You don't have to pick on me, you know. Rumbling to herself, she undid the string around the wrapping. Ah! You looked at the contents and puffed up again. Hey, this sandwich is burnt! Not that badly. You should still be able to eat it. I suppose. Give me a break. We carried on needling each other like this for a while. When suddenly someone came up and stood in front of you and me. No, maybe he'd been there for a long time. The kid was staring at both of us with a leaden gaze. Hey, what's wrong, kid? You don't want it? The kid held an op unopened fried chicken sandwich in his hand. You gotta stay healthy, kid. It's probably cold by now. You want me to heat it up again for you? I put out my hand. But he pulled the chicken sandwich er he pulled the sandwich close to himself and tried to get away. He looked at me with a hard expression. And kid crushed the sandwich in his hand. ta -da! Wait, what's going on? The kid is acting like Tsugumi. Using all his strength. The wrapping paper burst and sauce flew every which way. He'd gotten his clothes as well, but he didn't seem to notice. He didn't stop there. He took the mangled package and threw it with all of his might against the water on the ground. What? What the hell are you doing? His shoulders trembling, the kid kept his face down. He was finally able to drag out some words. Sick. Sick of it. It's all I can take. The kid kicked at the thin layer of water at its feet. I mean, chicken sandwiches aren't that bad. Like, even after eating nothing else for a week. Right? Everyone looked at him at once. I can't stand it anymore. I don't want any more fried chicken sandwiches. Unless he's in, like, a time loop. In which case, this is, like, entirely defensible. Like, after a week of fried chicken sandwiches, like, you get a little bit sick of them, but, like, probably not this sick. But, like, if he remembers other timelines and stuff, if he's been, like, eating nothing but fried chicken sandwiches for, like, subjective months, then this is entirely defensible. I'm sick of them. I want to eat something else. He screamed. Everyone's breath caught in their throats. But nobody had anything to say in reply. I'm sick. And tired. So what if we're still alive? There isn't any proof that anyone's gonna save us. What are we- what we're doing here? Everything that we're doing here. There's no point. There isn't any point for us being here. The kid raised a shaking fist. But not finding any direction to launch it, he lowered it again. Everyone tried to keep their eyes from meeting. It seemed like they were afraid of what we might see. They tried desperately to avert their gazes. Nobody moved. People pressed their lips firmly together and dared not to speak. S stupid fool, what the hell are you talking about? Finally, I looked up, shouting. Don't ask for the impossible. Do you have any idea what you're asking? The only food we have to eat is a sandwich in the snack shop upstairs, you know that. You tell me you're sick of it? You still have to eat it. It's the only way to survive. But you better be thankful for it. We're all putting up with it the best we can. We're one of the gang, right? We should be a little bit more cooperative. They're all being patient. They're helping out. Even if they don't like it, they eat and they're surviving. If we don't, then we're finished. Wake up. We're all going to get through this together. As long as we're alive, there's still hope. Boom. A loud metallic sound echoed throughout the room. It was a blunt sound. The floor shook slightly. Everyone staggered slightly and struggled to regain their balance. But nobody tried to do anything else. I know. I know that, Takeshi. I know. But still. Even though I know, what can I do? Ah! Just then, the, kick knocked, the kid knocked the sandwich out of Yu's hand. She hadn't even taken a bite out of her Tanaka special. It fell into the water with a splash and sank slowly. Bastard, what do you think you're doing? I went over and grabbed onto the kid and raised my hand. Oh. Unfortunately, for this route, we are not supposed to punch the kid. Which is deeply unfortunate, because I really want to punch him. But, 
We're committed. We can hit him next time. You. Cowed, the kid froze. I pulled back the hand that I had raised. It all felt so stupid. So terribly sad. The kid looked up at me all hunched up and trembling. I was disappointed in myself for having tried to hit someone like him. My heart ached with sadness. I let go of the kid's collar, and he backed away slowly. Everyone watched us silently. Ah, damn it, damn it. Tears welled up in his eyes. Kid, come on, I'm asking you. Lift up your head. I hadn't wanted to put- I, I hadn't wanted to blame him in the first place. I turned around and held my hand out again, but he wouldn't look me in the eyes. Even if you say that, Takeshi, I can't think like you. It's impossible is impossible. We're not all the same. I can't do it. It's not that strong. It'll never be. I can't go on living. I don't want to go on living. So then, I should just... I didn't want to make him say the rest. But I couldn't stop him. I knew how hard it would be for him to say it. Even I wasn't that strong. Everyone waited for the kid's next words in silence. They were probably unthinkable. Takeshi, stop it, please. Hmm? Hmm? Sora walked silently forward and stood between the kid and me. Takeshi, please stop being so hard on him. No, I don't mean it that way. Kid, please look up at us. I can't fight. Not like this. It isn't right. Sora looked sad as she said this. Sora, this isn't just any old fight. I'm not trying to shut him out, I just... I wanted him to know how important it was to keep eating. I know that. However... See, the kid looks like he's already feeling a little better. Sora smiled sl slightly as she said this. You really didn't mean it, okay? Please forgive him? Let's make another sandwich. It's a good thing there's still plenty of provisions left. No, that's not what I'm talking about. I screamed. Sora stared back at me, eyes wide with surprise. It isn't about that, Sora. It isn't about whether we have more or not. It isn't... Can't you understand that? I... I understand. No, I... Don't understand. Well, which one is it, Sora? I had taken all this much further than necessary. But I couldn't stop myself. Do you or don't you understand? Do you understand what I mean? Do you really understand why I would do something like that? So you don't know why I did it? You're a first-rate AI program, aren't you? T Takeshi? What do you want me to do? I... I... Sora started to waver. I... I don't understand. I don't know the answer. And looking down, Sora bit her lip. Oh, there's no way you could, could you? Understand how important food is. Because you aren't human like we are. Forget it. Besides, the floor just shook, right? What was that, Sora? Did something happened to Limu? What happened? Come on, tell us. If you check, you should find out in no time, right? Hurry up, why won't you tell me what happened? Takeshi, you're being a dick. Like, Granted, it's to an AI, but, like, still, being a dick. She thought she heard the sound of someone running in water. Sounds where there should have been none. Sora kept her distance from us and ran out of the exit of the room. Sora? After watching her run off, Tsugumi stood right in front of me. What? Tsugumi was glaring at me. Takeshi, you are such a scumbag. You went over the kid and hugged him around the shoulders. Koku and Pee, Pee absently looked around the room at everyone. Feeling like I was no longer wanted, I fled from the room. And on that somber note, uh, we will leave the rest for tomorrow. Peace.